namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa honor to him the blessed one the worthy one, the fully self-enlightened one. My utmost respect to this perfectly enlightened Samma Sambuddha, the noble doctrine of the Buddha and the noble Mahasanga, the disciples of the Buddha. Hello, dear Dhamma friends. Welcome to our special Dhamma Talk series. Under this, week, Dhamma, under this weekly Dhamma Talk series, we will cover up some very important topics on Theravada Buddhism to help benefit our community around the world. I certainly believe this effort by Dhamma USA is going to open up more horizon of Dhamma knowledge amongst our community. We are so delighted to have Noel Alumit as our guest speaker today. I'm confident that he has been amply trained with both Dhamma knowledge and practice. Dear Dhamma friends, please mark your calendar every Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific Time, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, and 7.30 a.m. Sri Lankan Time to get more benefit. Kindly check with Dhamma USA YouTube channel and Facebook page and Facebook groups for more updates. I'm pretty sure you are all going to enjoy the topic today, which is Dharma and Creativity. Kindly post your questions in the comment section of Dhamma USA YouTube channel so that we can answer them at the end of the talk. Without further ado, let me invite Noel Alumit to start his Dhamma sharing on Dharma and Creativity. Please pay your due attention seriously to achieve maximum benefit from his teaching today. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. First of all, thank you all very much for um, for having me. I'm truly honored to be here. Uh, I, when I got the invitation, um, and I was invited to share about anything. Um, I said, well, something very that's very, very near and dear to me is creativity, dharma and creativity. I, I want to just talk a little bit about, uh, about that um, because um, I... Uh, I'm I'm turning 55 on January 1st. Yeah, I'm turning 55 on January 1st. And when I was 44, I decided to go back to uh, to school. I decided to get my um, chaplaincy degree in my Buddhist chaplaincy degree. Um, and I was going to um, stop being an artist. I have been I've been creative uh, my entire adult life, and I decided that I think I should you know be, get a little smarter. Yeah, <laughs> I should you know I thought I should go back. You know, get a degree, and I was going to become a um, uh, a hospital chaplain. Yeah, I was going to become a hospital chaplain, and uh, I graduated 50 years old, and um, in deep uh, contemplation, deep meditation, and consultation with other people, I found that actually maybe one of the best ways that I could uh, give service, that I can be best useful in the world, one of the best ways I can discuss and spread dharma actually was as a creative person. Yeah. So um, I actually recommitted to my creative life. Um, I received, I, I've been uh, involved since I was a teenager in the arts and creativity. Uh, I almost consider it almost my first religion. Yeah, almost my first religion. And um, as I went along in divinity school, something I also noticed is that when I came to presentations and doing research, that it was still also around um, the arts and creativity, okay, particularly around Buddhism and Buddhist art and creativity. Okay, so um, why don't we jump to my slide presentation? So, um, what's been really interesting about this journey, yeah, um, was this whole discussion around right livelihood. Yeah, we're talking about well, what you know is right livelihood, right livelihood, and we can talk a little bit about that later. But um, something that had always happened when I was um, when I was uh, um, getting deeper into my practice was well, is is creativity, you know, um, 
right livelihood. And I've heard um, lots of people talk about this. I live in Los Angeles. I think there's a, a, a spiritual community in Los Angeles that's certainly a Buddhist community in Los Angeles. Um, and this is something that we sort of talked about. Yeah, was uh, is can, can you be an artist? Can you be an actor, a writer, a musician, a dancer? And can that be considered right livelihood? Um, just to give you some background, so that is me. Um, almost 30 years ago, <laughs> almost 30 years ago, um, in a uh, one-man show that I wrote, um, some background around what I do is I have been a member of the Screen Actors Guild um, since 1985, Yeah, since I was a teenager. Yeah. And, um, and during that time, during that period, uh, as I was trying to come up as a writer, um, there was not a lot of work. You know, any actor can say that. Will say that there's just not a lot of work. But something I'll say is that certainly, if you were an actor of color, an Asian American actor, there was just not a lot of work. So I began to write my own stuff. Yeah, um, I got a lot of pleasure um, and uh, spiritual fortitude from that. And this is from a show called The Rise from Scenes from Bar. Yeah. Um, when we're talking about livelihood, yeah, let's begin with what is a uh, wrong livelihood. Yeah, <laughs> what is a wrong livelihood? A lay follower should not engage in five types of business. Which five? Business and weapons, business and human beings, business and meat, business and intoxicants, and business in poison. Yeah. So it does not say show business, right? It does not say, you know, so like, okay, that's a, that's a step in the right direction. That's a step in the right direction. Like, okay, so it doesn't say show business. Now, I do want to say say something about this, and I always joke, is that, um, well, if creativity is not right livelihood, um, and actors are working as waiters who are actually um, having to do with maybe um, the, the business of meat and intoxicants with liquor, I thought, oh, wow, well, actors are doomed. You know, <laughs> we have these careers, you know, where we don't know if we're doing right livelihood. Um, and we're engaging in businesses where is, is that the biggest right livelihood? And I just want to say this. This is I'm not I'm not at all being mean or bashing um, Asian restaurants, right? Because we know Asian restaurants, um, a number of them could be Buddhist, yeah, could be Buddhist, are dealing in practices um, such as in the use of meat or intoxicants, right? Of of liquor and things, yeah. So um I guess what it comes right down to it is like, you know, what is the right motivation and um the right dude behind that. Yeah. And now, um, there's been discussion in some of the communities I'm, I've been involved with is the idea is, well, um, what about creativity? You know, and there was actually some really, really important discussion about that. Yeah. Um, and it was this particular text in particular that was um, being brought up over and over and over again. Yeah. La Tulapata Sutta Sutta from the Samyata Nikaya. Right. Um, now, in this particular text, right, in this particular text, uh, Parapata um, is an actor, right, and is asking um, the Buddha this question about, well, you know, uh, basically saying, you know, I'm this actor, you know, I make people feel, I, I spread passion, and um, if that's the case, is it true that I will, I will land in the realm, in the land of laughing devas, right, in laughing devas? You know, not 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 in a bad place, but in a in a magical place, the laughing devas, right? Um, and so we asked, but if you hold such a view as this, when an actor on the stage in the midst of a festival makes people laugh and gives them delight with his imitation of reality, then with the breakup of the body after death, he is reborn in the company of the laughing devas. That is wrong view. Now, there are two destinations for a person with wrong view, I tell you, either hell or the animal womb. Yeah. So um, when, uh, when the actor first asked this to the Buddha, the Buddha's response was, don't talk to me about that. <laughs> like, this is like, you know, don't talk to me about that, whether an actor will, you know, because he's doing what he's doing, you know, or she's doing what she's doing, will, will land in, 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 in uh, the company of laughing devas. Um, and for a long time, I'm trying to picture what does this land of laughing devas look like? You know, it sounds like a fun place to me. You know, have you ever been to a party? You know, I think, oh, I'd love to be reborn into the land of laughing devas, right? And it was this, this you can certainly look it up and, and read the whole thing, but it was this, actually, that, that had caused some controversy with some creative friends of mine, 
you know, it was like, oh, I think they're saying that, you know, that um, uh, that we will be we will we will be doomed, you know, we will be doomed um, to hell. I'm alone because we're we're actors, you know, or we're musicians, or we're painters, or we're poets, or whatever. Because one of the things that we do out in the world, yeah, is we cause people to stir stir up feelings, yeah. We're causing people to stir up emotions. Right? We're causing people to think, yeah. We're causing passions. We're causing passions, you know. And I think to myself, oh my gosh, that's that that that's not good. You know, should we, you know, as artists and Buddhist practitioners, do things so we can calm the mind? Yeah. It's not what we're supposed to be doing, calm the mind. And what we're doing is we're just sort of, you know, um, causing people to get excited, you know. If anyone's seen the Mar a Marvel movie or you know, or any kind of movie recently, just like, you know, I just I just saw um uh, the new Avatar movie, and I was like, really got into it. The colors, the beauty, you know, oh my gosh, you know. I'm thinking, well, is this, you know, is this bad somehow to feel this way, right? To, to feel this way. Are we, as artists, doing, you know, um, detrimental things to the audience? Yeah. And I don't think that um, when he says here that um, that is wrong view, I don't think he's saying the profession is the wrong view, right? I don't think he's saying the creative profession is the wrong view. It is the view that we think just because we are who we are, that will somehow land in the company of Latin Deva. Yeah, that we think, oh, you know, that we think that's because we're creative and we joke we're doing and we think we're making, you know, art in the world that will land in the Latin Deva. That from you. Yeah, that is something we should we should be careful of. Yeah, um, I've been in the creative professions for a very 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 long time, and you know, there are a lot of artists out there. Who can do some real damage in the world? You know, they've done, they have done some real damage in the world. They're, they're egotistical, they're mean, they're predatory, right? The whole Me Too movement has is, is been a sign of that. You know, Oscar So White was another sign of that. You know, that, that there are uh, all sorts of things abound racism, sexism, you know, homophobia is abound, right? So just because we're artists does not guarantee us good karma, right? Does not guarantee that we'll go into a better life, right? So, I think that is what we're talking about, which which began to lead to the discussion is uh, somebody talked about um, in this particular was um, uh, we as odd we have to be asked questions as audience members as audience members and we have to ask questions as um, creative artists okay about the content we're ingesting you know and the content that we're putting out in the world yeah which we should be mindful of what we're watching and what we're seeing. And sort of seeing like, well, is 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 this raising the wrong kind of passions, you know? Particularly nowadays, um, as we, you know, as people are, are sort of watching this all over the world, and we have access to um, all sorts of social media, and you know, people are posting things all the time about things, you know. Um, and uh, I don't know about you, but I've got in that rabbit hole, you know, like I'll watch something and I get caught up in in, in the passions of what people are saying, you know. And there's a problem is to stop. You know, stop. Just be mindful of what this will bring up to you, bring up for me. You know, do I want to be a part of that? Yeah. And something that we have to think about as artists are what kind of content are we bringing into the world? Yeah. What kind of content are we bringing into the world? Okay. So, um, I asked this question of creative people out there. You know, for those of you doing creative people, you know, something to consider. You know. When we create the work we do, whether we dance, whether we write, whether we uh, play the guitar or the piano, you know, you know, are we creating work where we are not doing harm? Yeah. Are we not doing harm in the world? Yeah. Are we easing suffering? Are we easing suffering? Let me, let me tell you the story. You know, I was, um, you know, I'm an actor and um, I was what they call pinned for projects. Yeah. Um, and uh, I didn't have to audition. They said, you have a callback for this, for this commercial. Yeah. A callback for a commercial for cigarettes. <laughs> and I thought to myself, oh, wow, gosh, I really need the money. Artists understand that feeling, you know, but at the end of the day, I thought, why well, I really can't do a project promoting cigarettes. You know, I just, uh, so I actually pulled myself out of that project. I, I don't think it's something I'd like to do. Yeah. Now, when you're an actor, I just want to say I have no judgment for actors or people who say yes to things like that. Matter of fact, in my younger years, in my much younger years, I actually did a cigarette commercial for Japan. Yeah, I did a, a cigarette commercial for Japan um, many, many, many years ago. Um, oddly enough, I have a picture of it right here. This is back in 19, 
Yeah, this is back in 1987. That's so cool. Yeah, right? 1987, yeah. Um, where I did a commercial. And um, let me tell you, you know, without even thinking about it, I said yes. Without even thinking about it, I said yes. I needed the money, you're right? I, I got $3,000 for that one project, and my rent at the time was $300 a month, okay? So that would that would keep me you know keep me instead for for several months there right so for doing that job now would i do that today probably like i said i would not i would not you know so we make these choices as we do as artists and trust me i know artists wonder all the time gee you know i you know should i say yes to this project you know i need the money but you know i might have to work with difficult people so so those things we have to consider too yeah where are you in your in your station and what yeah is the work that we're creating, is it easing suffering? You know, do you think it'll ease suffering? Yeah. Are the projects that we're engaging in, are the things that we're writing, would encourage useful, contemplative, deep thoughts? Yeah. Will it encourage critical or analytical thinking, not discursive thinking? Okay. You know, uh, we want to make sure that just because we're artists, let's not assume that we will be reborn in the land of laughing devas. <laughs> you know, our tool, but all too, our art also has karma. Yeah, you know, what we do with our art also has karma, right? What we're projecting, what we're creating out in the world also has karma. Yeah. Um, and something um, I want to say is that you know, being a creative person, you know, is an honorable and humble profession. Yeah. Let's 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 re re remember, remember that. And I say this, you know, um, I'm certainly not rich. I'm not famous. You know, but I still think that what I do is really, really good work, right? important work, okay? So when we think of this as artists, particularly those who are creative out there, just, just think about the work that we're doing and the work we're trying to put out in the world, okay? So um, when I was in school, we were asked to do presentations on Buddhism, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about was uh, the Dong Huang Caves. The, the Getty Museum out here did a, um, an exhibition on the Dong Huang Caves. Caves, yeah, um, and this is uh, a, a photo from that exhibition. Okay, so now in the Dong Huang Caves, there was this inscription in the cave um, written in the Tang Dynasty: uh, "Wherever faith exists, it will not be altered by human affairs." These who believe deeply in the Buddha consider it possible that when he arrives, the wind and waves will be calmed, thereby he will be welcomed to the Dong Huang temples and be worshipped forever. Yeah. Created so, you know, um, uh, as a testament of the work of the Don Juan Caves. I said the artist there. Now, um, the art we'll be seeing from that, particular, uh, from that particular period, we don't know who the artists are. Okay. They will probably be like me, nameless, faceless, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, we'll just sort of create and create work and we'll talk about, you know, perhaps some of the reasons why they created that work. But, um, there was a book that came from that exhibition called Cave Temples of Dong Huang. Um, Hu Sui Man Shen and Mimi Garner Gates uh, were the um, contributors for that. I think they were the curators. And they said that this work is a testament to human achievement. The Buddhist grottos of Dong Huang are a singular expression of mankind striving for artistic beauty and transcendence of mortality. Okay? So, you know, when you look at this, you know, just, you know, there, there were dozens of these caves, dozens of these caves where people were creating these statues, you know, you know, painstakingly painting these walls, right? You know, trying to, trying to um, create something. Now, maybe they don't consider themselves artists. Maybe they're craftspeople, yeah. But the ultimate end, end result was something creative and something beautiful and something like that. Okay, and when we take a look at that piece of art, when we take a look at that, you know, we don't realize they did, the people who were created probably did not realize the impact of their work. Okay, because what it ended up doing was symbolize a period and time. Okay, symbolize cultures. Okay, that it was a curious blending of Indian imagery and symbolism into Chinese style painting. That Tong Huang or Dong Huang became a very important center of Buddhist art. Buddhism reached there by way of both the northern and southern Takumakan roots. The monastery founded in um, the uh, third century on a site abounding with grottos and caves 
gradually expanded in number and space, finally culminating in that of a thousand Buddhas and extended all along the entire area present, uh, present a vast complex. The Donghuang paintings are illuminating documents for the study of Mahayana Buddhism, but of greater interest for the study of art. Yeah. So why did they do this? We were wrong. Why, why, why did they do this? Did they get some pleasure? Maybe. Did they get paid? Maybe. You know. But some of the cultural traits about this is that um, it shows the Chinese Buddhist art in concept and style. Yeah. The paintings, despite the monotony of subject matter, um, exhibit a considerable variety of style. Okay. But there, you can tell it was done by different people. And I want to say that that is the stamp of an artist, right? It doesn't all look the same. Someone will paint the Buddha one way, and another person will paint the Buddha a different way. Yeah, yeah. that is what what gives it like an, an artistic point of view. Yeah, purely Indian art is represented by a small group of paintings, which are probably Nepalese. On the other hand, there are a number of entirely Chinese ones as well. So you see these cultures melding together. Between these two extremes are the pictures of intermediate style, the productions of the local school of Turkestan, or in some cases, provincial Chinese school. Way and Tang period. A few works are Tibetan. Some traces of Western influence are noticeable in the rendering of figurines, figures and the clothes. And you can see the impact of Greco Buddhist school and kinship with India. Yeah. All of that, all of that from this from this area, right? All this from this area. And let me let me point this out. When we see the face of Buddha, originally we did not know what the Buddha looked like. Right? We had no idea what the, no, we don't know what the Buddha looked like, right? We can guess, right? But in the earlier creative voice, it was uh, you know. Um, footprints or a chair, yeah. But as human being, yeah, as a way to better understand this, yeah, to humanize Buddhism, yeah, we started giving Buddha you know, quite an acquiring faces. Yeah, we wanted to see ourselves, you know, in Buddhism, and we wanted that reflected back to us. Okay, more art. So when we talk about iconography, yeah, there was replication or creation of Buddhist images gently generates merit and is an act of devotion as much encouraged in Buddhist text. Yeah. So part of doing this, part of doing this Buddhist art was that it was a meritorious act, right? If I paint the images of the Buddha, right? A Buddhist stories, a Buddhist iconography, you're actually developing good karma. <laughs> By doing this, you're developing good karma. Whoever the individuals were somehow developing karma. Yeah, good karma. Yeah. Um, which is good, right? You want to do good deeds. Yeah. Right. That you walk into that place, like you look at that place, and that place is thousands of years old, right? Let me show you this. Thousands of years old, and even thousands of years later, I look at that and I think, wow, you know, the painting is peeled, you know, it's obviously been weathered. But I used to think, wow, wow, you know, how absolutely stunning. Yeah. And then um, there were some very specific images that were made here. Uh, caves were iconic in India. Um, some of the images that, 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 that happened there, they were showing several narratives, you know. They were uh, depicting iconic images of the Buddha. They were, in, they were telling stories, Buddhist narratives, like that uh, Jataka tale, right. They were also showing Chinese mythical figures. Okay? They were having legends, relations, re legendary relations to the history of Buddhism, sutra illustration donor portraits, decorative patterns, right? So all of that, they were telling stories, they were trying to, you know, at, at, you know we all say that um, earlier, before, before Buddhism was written down, right, it was chanted, right, from generation to generation, it was chanted from generation to generation. Well, this was another way of telling that story, right, with the images, yeah, through images, yeah. Now, when we talk about um, this, I want to talk about architecture just a little bit. Yeah, the philosopher Hegel would talk about that architecture is the mother of the arts. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright also said something very similar. You know, you take a look at this. This tiger's nest in Bhutan. Yeah. Is that a work of art or what? Wow, yeah, that's very beautiful. <laughs> is that stunning or what? Yeah. <laughs> to think about, I mean, to think about the people who had to climb that mountain <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. and build that temple. Right, build those temples, and then inside, I don't have pictures of inside Tiger's Nest, but you, you look inside, but the, you know, and then you have images in there, and all of that, right, all of that is to inspire devotion, right, creativity, to inspire awe, to, to, to help us, you know, as practitioners go in there and go, wow, this is amazing, yeah, 
Right. That actually reminds me, um, the temple reminds me of a of the hike that Bandi Sumit and I did with some other um, venerables from Empty Cloud Monastery. Um, we went up like to this really high hill and like there was a church there and like it was in Italy. So like, of course, like um, Catholicism is very preserved there. Mm -hmm. So like, just like how you're explaining here in Buddhist terms, like they were really creative with the way they express Catholicism and their teachings and such. Italy is rich with that. Yeah, I was there yeah. seven years ago. I mean, you take a look at, you know, if you've ever been to the Vatican and all the paintings yeah. on the walls, right in the Vatican, the artwork on the walls, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, the churches, the cathedrals, right? It does it inspire a sense of awe, right? right. Something spiritual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the temple to the same. Yeah. Of course, Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Yeah. Um, uh, I have yet to, you know, to visit Cambodia, you know, but there was a wonderful exhibition out here in Los Angeles. I was exploring this, yeah, that um, this was uh, probably part of the Buddhist kingdom, uh, Srivijaya, um, which ruled Southeast Asia for 600 years. Yeah, but when you take a look again, the artistry and the architecture of what it took to have built this, yeah. And according to that a particular exhibition is that uh, Angkor Wat is the largest, just as far as landmass, right? The largest um, spiritual, uh, physical location in the world, yeah, because of its, its size and depth, yeah. Um, Norton Simon, the Norton Simon collection, um, a really interesting character. He began to collect Buddhist art, yeah, and these are some of the things in his collection. This is, um, this was, I believe this was art that uh, was um, uh, either developed, well, yeah, it was developed and then eventually found along the Silk Road, yeah. Oh, no, well, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but I've always wondered, like, um, every so often I do see the Buddha statues that look like, that have, like, the other hands um, to the right to the side. Yeah, so like, what does that represent? I don't, if, I don't know if you know, but to my understanding, so it was um, uh, uh, an action where the Buddha uh, touched the earth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, touched the earth, and the earth shook. <laughs> was 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 part of the lore behind something like that. Yeah. Um, and just recently, just this month, the magazine Art in America uh, was talking about um, making Buddhist art today, vibrant beings uh, making Buddhist art today. Some of the images from that, you can easily find this online. It's very Googleable. Google <laughs> yeah. Michael Jews' Body of Uscatus. Yeah. So in those very same, when we saw the Norton Simon collection where they found art you know, in Gandhara along the Silk Road, that um, it's something similar to that, but he modernized it. So you see that those those things that are around him are, are cameras. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The cameras filming. Yeah. Because again, talking about, you know, I think, you know, sort of like the, the modernity you know, Buddhism today, right? It's not just, we just don't have like a statue. We have these, these cameras watching it, looking at it. Yeah. I show why size the womb and the diamond. And what I want to say out loud is that when we think about Buddhist art, it doesn't have to have an image of the Buddha. Yeah. This is obviously conceptual art. Um, this is uh, um, inspired by the Japanese, the womb and the diamond. Yeah. Uh, a form of meditation. So there's little glass, glasses in the middle. Yeah, so represent that. Um, this is African American artist Faith Ringgold. Um, these are her tankas. Um, she was in a museum and she saw a Tibetan tankas. Yeah, and from that inspired her, you know, to create these. Yeah, African American tankas. And of course, uh, photographer Don Farber's um, image. Yeah, his uh, drama project, heritage project. Um, one of my favorites, if you look, you know, closely to that, on the upper right side, there are nuns in an Alice in Wonderland ride. Okay, do you see that? That is just hilarious to me, you know. 
and of course, Doc Robb is known for his images of um, of, uh, of, of of teachers, as you can see, his Holiness Dalai Lama is there, Thich Nhat Hanh is there, in the bottom lower 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 left, yeah. Wow. And then, of course, we have Buddhist writing, yeah. That um, Thich Nhat Hanh's book, uh, a collection of poems, "Call Me by My True Names," yeah. Uh, we have uh, this is an incredible book of short stories, Nighthawks by Charles Johnson. Really, really amazing. The Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Ozeki. Um, I had the pleasure of teaching uh, Buddhist American literature um, at the University of the West, and this was a, a remarkable book. Yeah? There's a lot of actually Buddhist work, Buddhist writing out there in the world. And of course, you know, here there are uh, there's work by Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, and Siddhartha. I mean, by Herman Hester, both Siddhartha. And of course, I've talked about the entertainers that are out there in the world. You know, it's Katie Lang and Tina Turner, um, and then a martial artist, Jet Li, a musician, Herbie Hancock, and of course, one of the most famous American Buddhists, Richard Gere. Yeah. And um, something I will say, what's been really amazing, uh, particularly you know here in Los Angeles, actually in creative work in the creative community, Buddhism is not you know, um, new, yeah, that um, in creative communities, the, you know, Buddhism, Buddhist concepts like meditation, you know, mm -hmm, yeah. is important, right? Yeah. Um, so it's so, you know, when it comes to um, creativity, um, I actually think creativity is, is rather welcoming of Buddhism, yeah, and Buddhist thoughts and Buddhist ideas, yeah. Now, Something I do want to talk about um, for the artists out there, for all of us out there, yeah, is this note on um, frustration, okay, whether it's creative frustration or professional uh, frustration. Um, every artist will tell you that part of our of our jobs is to endure rejection, yeah, endure rejection. Um, but something we have to think about is that well, that is affirming of of the noble truths, right? Life is suffering, including the creative life. Yeah, with the creative life, you know. But yes, it's difficult, you know. Um, yes, it can be hard. The lifestyle can be hard, right? Do we have enough money to pay our rent? Do we have enough money to make our bills? Yeah. In addition to things like, gosh, how do I make this piece work? You know, how do I make this poem work? You know, how do I make this musical work? How do I make this story work? You know. How do I make this dance work? You know, um, I'm also paid. Uh, this painting is not happening. I don't understand what 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 makes why it's not coming together. You know, you know? that too is part of of um, the the creative artistic life. Is that kind of frustration? Yeah. And um, of course, what we have to do is again turn back to the Dharma. Yeah, take the Eightfold Path. Okay, particularly a mindfulness effort and concentration. Yeah, to be mindful of these feelings of anxiety we might be feeling. And I say this because artists are prone to anxiety and depression. I will say that we be mindful of that ourselves. Yeah, that we uh, we put in effort to our you know put the effort in, in our work. Yeah, and we concentrate on what we're trying to do and say. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to. Uh, uh, end with this quote. It is one of my favorite quotes. It's from A Short History of Myth by the um, esteemed religion writer Karen Armstrong. Yeah. And she wrote, if it is written with serious attention, a novel like a myth or any great work of art can become an initiation that helps us to make a painful rite of passage from one phase of life, one state of mind to another. A novel, like a myth, teaches us to see the world differently. It shows us how to look into our hearts and to see the world from a perspective that goes beyond our own self-interest. If professional religious leaders cannot instruct us in the mythical lore, our artists and creative writers can perhaps step into this priestly role and bring fresh insight into our lost and damaged world. Kevin Armstrong. And I'm ending presentation with some of my own art that I've created. <laughs> um, 
Thank you very much. Yeah, I do uh, visual arts. I, um, you know, I'm a writer. I work at Lions Roar um, as an editor. By the way, I'm always looking for stories. So if you're out there and you're listening, feel free to contact me at lionsroar.noel.alumit at lionsroar.com. I'm always interested in pictures and and ideas for stories, personal essays, things like that. So feel free to reach out to me. But um, I wanted to open up the question. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Noelle Alumit, for this um, profound speech on dharma and creativity. I'm sure all our dharma friends around the world were benefited today. Um, we will take up your questions now, and we encourage you to post your questions in simple language through the Dhamma USA YouTube channel. I also did want to provide some background of um, Noel. So I'm actually really impressed that um, you were an um, associate editor for Lions Roar um, and also a professor at the University of the West. Um, he's also been a, commission, a commissioner for the California a Commission on Asian and Pacific Islander American Affairs. Um, so that's really that's really cool to see um, how you're practicing Buddhism in this way as well. Okay, so we do have a comment from Dhamma USA. So Noel does have a wonderful resume. Please take a look at more about him here um so you can look at the link um i can also put that in the comment section we have a question from dhamma usa how did you become a buddhist that's Very a great question. question well it was um uh it was an interesting journey yeah so i'm filipino um, I was born to Catholicism. Um, I worked in the Asian community for a very long time, a very long time, uh, 20 years. <laughs> so I'm um, even um, longer than that, right? And um, I was doing, uh, working for the Asian Pacific Aid and Intervention Team. Um, and in that kind of space, you know, working in, in the Asian Pacific community, specifically working in a subject like AIDS during the hot, during its height. Yeah, um, there was a lot of grief involved there. Yeah. There was a lot of grief, a lot of emotions going on. And trying to deal with all of that, trying to deal with um, that, uh, I began to have questions about you know, my surroundings and the world around me, yeah. Um, and fortunately, being in the Asian community, I was surrounded by Asian American Buddhists, actually. You know, and we talked about Buddhism. And as I was, as I, I talked to them about, Buddh about Buddhism and meditation, I thought to myself, well, I believe that. <laughs> I believe that. I believe, I believe everything that was said about Buddhism. I said, well, well then maybe I should take a deeper look into it, you know. And then I, I, as I looked to a deeper look into it, I'm like, I'm Buddhist. You know? <laughs> so I realized I'm Buddhist after all, you know. And you know, and something I've, I've written about in the past is that, um, you know, uh, I was I was born Catholic, and I, I was like, oh gosh, you know, but I was born Catholic, you know, and I will say that um, uh, one time in deep prayer, in deep, deep prayer, I said, what am I supposed to do? And I really felt like I heard this this very spiritual voice say, uh, what, 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 what one might call God or, or, or the universe say, you, you know, this voice said, there are different ways to find me, and there are different ways to find, you know, spirituality, to find, you know, comfort and uh, spiritual ease in this world, you know. And from that, I began to pursue Buddhism more, and I began to visit different sanghas, and then I finally, um, you know, met people. Like, oh, I connected with this, you know, I connect with the sangha, you know. And from there, I wanted to deepen my practice some more, you know. Um, by the time I got to my 40s, I said, well, what do I really want to do? And I said, well, I, I worked in AIDS. I thought I could work in palliative care, end of life care. And I think I'd be good at that, you know. Um, and uh, as I began to study Buddhism, getting deeper into my practice, um, I decided, you know, I think 
this was a life for me. You know, Buddhism is a life for me. I, I personally, I think it was a life for me in previous lifetimes. And I think at one time I said to myself, I think I'd like to be born a Christian. Just to see what it feels like. You know? <laughs> I, I felt it, I experienced it, I lived it, that's good. I was, you know, Catholic for 35, 36 years of my life. And I think that, you know, um, I was meant to be through this. So there you go. Um, the, your response is really interesting. It's funny, like, growing up, I feel like um, I was always shy to, like, express my culture or even, like, say that I was a Buddhist because no one in my school or, like, I thought, like, knew about it or, like, I, at least I thought nobody did um, up until recently. And um, like when I started doing um, meditation retreats, then like all the monks were like, no, like, you know, you should be proud of it. Um, <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, I should. I am. Um, well, okay. We have just like coming out and telling people you're Buddhist, like my friends around me, you know, they were able to, to, uh, to benefit others. They benefited me. You know, I'm like, oh, tell me about that. What was it like? Then? Uh, I will say what's interesting is that the um, people like you who were born and raised into it have a very different experience than people like me. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. who, who experience conversion. You know, I remember talking to a Vietnamese American friend, you know, um, who said, oh, my gosh, Noah, can you imagine being a kid, six years old, going to temple and chanting for hours? Can you imagine how hard that was? <laughs> like, oh, yeah. God. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's funny you mentioned that because that was like one of the things like I dreaded going to like the temple when like my family was like, oh, like we have to go. But I'm like, no, I want to hang out with my friends. But now I'm just like, why would I ever dread? I mean, like I like I say I dread it, but like actually like I knew that like I still like believe like I still always cherish the Buddhist teachings. But it was more of like, oh, like I just want to do kid things. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so we do have another question from Demo USA. Okay, can you speak about your role in Lions Roar? Sure. Um, well, I'd encourage people to check out the magazine, lionsroar.com. Yeah, um, it is a magazine dedicated to uh, uh, exploring Buddhism. Um, we have uh, a couple publications, right? Lions Roar magazine which is a print magazine that comes out about five or six times a year, yeah. Um, and then we have the Lions Roar website, which is a little more dynamic, yeah, so that uh, we can post more immediately to things uh, and not wait a few months for it to hit the magazine, for example. And then and we then have another magazine. Oh, I'm hearing an echo. Oh, are you hearing an echo? So, so. Give me one second. You can't hear that far. That's far. Okay, is it better now? Um, yeah, there we go, it's gone, okay. okay. So, Lion's Roar is a Buddhism for a general audience, for a broader audience, yeah. Um, and then there is Buddha Dharma, which is uh, another publication out of Lion's Roar Foundation. Um, and Buddha Dharma is a magazine that is um, a Buddhist, Buddhist speaking to other Buddhists, yeah. So we have those different um, outlets. I mean, my job as an associate editor at Lions Roar is to help develop uh, content for all platforms, including one, um, including our Lions Roar podcast. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I'm focusing specifically on Asian American content. Um, so it doesn't have, I, please pitch me ideas. You don't necessarily have to be Asian American to do that, you know, but um, the primary role is to, to bring out more um, Asian American point of views. I'm going to come to Buddhism because um, uh, Asians make up about uh, 60 to 70 percent of Buddhists in America. Yeah, something like that. So it's obviously, we obviously have a very important voice um, out there. You know, and you should consider writing something. <laughs> so, <laughs> really, we're open to these ideas, we're open to these stories. And um, uh, I, I started um, working there. Um, not too long ago, just August of 2022. Um, and uh, I like to think that we've put out some really awesome stories already, you know, about um, Asian American Buddhism. We also uh, have made a concerted effort to uh, bring up the voices of African Americans and Latinos also. Yeah. 
So um, there's a wide range of um, opinions and ideas about Buddhism at, at lionsroar.com. Wow, yeah, that, that's really cool. Um, that actually reminds me. So when you were talking about like acting and, and things like that in the, in the um, beginning of the video, um, it reminded me like when I was younger, I, I was always like wanting to be an actress and like that was like the only thing that I would say. And like, I guess like, uh, like when I would say to like, you know, um, around like cultural um, environments, like they'd be like, no, like you have to go like to college, things like that. I mean, like, of course, like, yeah. Um, but like, I, I guess like with Buddhism too, I was always like questioning, oh, like do, like would I go to hell if I like, um, if I'm kind of representing myself as a different person on TV, just like how you were saying, like if we're, um, you know, like in how the, the like, uh, the Buddha said, like, um, if we're, like, we shouldn't, like, be really, like, you know, changing people's view, but, like, it can be confusing, I guess, like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, I, I guess it is, you know, when we, we do this, right, it, it's, we're not trying to be, be destructive about what we're trying to do, and you know, we're trying to, do, you know, um, do good deeds in the world, yeah, and art can do that also, I mean, art yeah. and creativity yeah. can do that, you know. It can right. be a um, important statement about time, about identity. We can raise questions about who we are and, and, and how we fit into the world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay. We have another question from the USA. How can someone contribute towards this magazine? Well, um, you can contact me at noel.alumit at limesroar.com. Um, feel free to put that in the in the chat, um, and just you know uh, the way it'll work is you'll 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 say yeah I have this idea, okay I'll ha I have this idea, and I'll say well, well email me tell me what your idea is tell me what your idea is all about you know and we can talk about that um, and uh, what I've said with writers is I'll say well maybe think of like three things you want to write about you know three things you want to write about because then I'll, we'll talk about it and I'll say you know what. I really love number one and two, maybe not so much number three, yeah. And when we say no to a piece, it's not necessarily it's a bad idea, right? Um, it may be because we already did something on it already, you know. Um, we had this, like, someone had pitched an idea for a story, and I said, well, we actually have someone writing that idea already, you know. So, um, and we talk about it, we go back and forth, you know. Um, something I will say to writers is that if you pitch an idea, please make sure you're willing to write that idea, okay? <laughs> because some people will have a great idea, you know, but they haven't really, like, massaged the idea yet. They haven't really thought it out yet, you know? Um, and then they realize, oh, my gosh, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of research, you know, to do. So, yeah, so just, just remember that. I'm, I'm really cool with when it comes to deadlines, you know? Um, another thing you can do is go ahead and write the essay, right? You can write the essay, you can write the piece, and then you can submit it to me. Right. And then we'll say, you know, this might work for us. You know, um, I says, we may, it may not work for us. Now, I will say this, um, because I've often been on the other end of rejections, right? I've often been on the other, other end of rejections. That has been, the, any creative person will tell you that is just sort of part of, of, our, of, our, of, our, of our livelihood, yeah. Um, so now, I, so now um, I'm in the position where I have to reject ideas also. And it's not a bad idea. And I think that's the thing we need to know about creative people. Your idea is not a bad idea. What you created is not a bad project. You know, it's not bad music. It's not a bad painting. You know, it's just, you know, it's not fitting into sort of like what we were planning at this time. So at this point in my life, I'm like, okay, I understand. You know, I have a collection of short stories coming out next year, right? I've been trying to get that book published for 12 years, okay? For 12 years, you know? You know, but um, in the, for whatever reason, um, in the last year, a few publishers were kind of interested in it. You know? So all of a sudden, someone's interested in it. The same thing with my work as an actor. You know, like I said that I... Um, got my degree in acting. I got my BFA in acting from the University of Southern California a million years ago. I was an actor, um, and then I and then I left acting to do more writing because there's just the work wasn't not there. Yeah, the work was not there, 
And so now, um, uh, years later, I'm like, well, you know, I seem to see more more of Asian actors around. You know, let me try this again. You know, so I'm doing it again. I'm having a good time. And and I've noticed a difference, by the way, um, in, in in acting that before, you know, I would get a few auditions. You know, um, now my auditions have like, I've, you know, <laughs> have gotten, you know, have 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 doubled and tripled. I say, I auditioned. Uh, for more things in the last year than I did the entire decade of the 1990s. Okay, so uh, yeah, so so things have changed. People are at least more open to it too. Yeah, um, and the world too has shifted. You know, mm -hmm. um, about impermanence is that now my auditions are like this. You know, before you have to be, you have to live in Los Angeles, you have to go drive to the audition. Now we're like tape. You got to tape it. You gotta tape it, wow. you know. So now, so now I'm, I'm I'm usually here. I take down these paintings. I take down these paintings. We put a blank wall. You know, I do my audition. You know, I I will edit it on my computer and I send in my audition. Yeah. So the world has changed. Yeah. And chances are that's the way it's going to be in the acting world from now on. It will be that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Soft tapes. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Noel, for that. Um, before you. Before we move on to the next question, can you please um, type in your lines, your email address in the comment section? Okay, let me get out of that comment section, which I'm navigating. Okay. Thank you. I'm not sure how to do that. I see that I see the comment section, but I'm not it, I'm I'm not seeing a box for me to comment. Okay. Um, or can I let me let me put it in the private chat? Yeah, you can I, do that. You can go ahead and share that. Okay, thank you. Great. Yeah. And I'm open for for new ideas. And as I'm saying, 23, we're ready for new stories, new articles out there. Yeah. And yeah. when it comes, yeah. I'm sorry. No, you can continue. Oh, I just wanted to say, you know, um, uh, we're really interested in a lot of things. You know, we're really interested in, in what you have to say. You know, again, my, my primary uh, beat is Asian American Buddhism, you know. So um, uh, we're looking for personal essays. Yeah. Um, I, possible ideas for for feature writing. You know, if there's um, uh, if there's a, an interesting angle you might want to take on uh, you know, an interesting angle on something. Yeah. Um, and usually when we ask that person essays about a thousand words. Yeah, a thousand words on something. Um, I would also strongly suggest you go to lionsroar.com. Take a look at the content that we that we have out there. Yeah, familiar your, familiarize yourself with the magazine with the content so you have an idea of the kind of work we put out there okay so yeah that's actually interesting um so my younger sister she's actually a model um she started modeling last year so um she's been on vogue already um yeah and on um she's on the allure magazine so that like actually reminded me like that's uh like it, I, I'm definitely gonna tell her about this, and like, I'd love for her to like write her her own perspective on like going into the modeling career, you know, as a Buddhist. Um, yeah. And as an Asian American too. Um, so yeah, some of I remember like some of the one of the shoots actually that she did was like with Asian American girls, and like something that she had said was like, oh, like you know, the the beauties like the beauty of like Asian culture is like different that like it was um, it's not always like represented well enough in schools or things like that. So it really, I think it really connects with, um, it'd be a great, great topic to interconnect with um, Buddhism and you and creativity. I'd love to hear it. Yeah. I would love to hear it. Yeah. I, re I really, really am looking for stories all the time, you know, mm -hmm. so for people out there listening to this broadcast, you know, don't be shy about that. I will say this, I will say this, because I also teach writing. I teach writing all the time. I've been teaching writing since uh, 2005, 
right, for uh, you say extension, yeah. right? And I will have people, and I will have people um, say, please reach out to this agent. I'll have an agent come and talk. And I gotta say, you know, people don't do it. People don't do it. Particularly Asian American people, they don't do it. They're too shy. You know, like other people do. I'm like, you gotta, you know, <laughs> you gotta break out of that. You <laughs> know, please, you know, please, we want to hear from you. That's why I'm there. You know, don't be shy about the idea. What's the worst thing I can say? No, you know, that's it. You know, and if it's not that, you know, something I know about professional writers, professional artists, is that that no does not stop them. I will say, okay, so. I, I'm 55, you know, and, I, and I got my I got my first agent when I was 16. Okay, when I was 16 years old, right? You know, I have experienced thousands of no's. I can literally say that. You know? <laughs> I can literally say thousands of no's. Yeah, you know. But what what we need to do is we just have to just get up and keep going. Yeah, keep get up and keep going. It is the being able to write, being able to speak, you know, through our creativity. Yeah. That is a gift. Yeah. We are given this opportunity to speak. Let's please use our voices. Okay. Thank you. We have another question here. Uh, in Buddhism, we hear about getting rid of art, beauty, etc. What's your response to that as a Buddhist artist? Well, I think that's that's really interesting. Well, first of all, you know, when we when I think about things like that, particularly now these days, you know, it can, it can be worrisome. Yeah, because we're, we're talking about things like censorship. You know, we're talking about that, and when we start censoring, um, you know, art, beauty, etc., well, then so will a bunch of other things get censored, like religion. Right? You know, so who's to who's to determine, you know, um, what is considered beautiful and what is considered art? Yeah. Um, again, you know, when you, you know, um, with the rise of, of Asian hate, one of one of the things that that one of the ways that has manifested, I know here in Los Angeles, is that uh, some of the Buddhist temples have been defaced. Yeah, you know, um, that the beauty of these temples have been defaced. You know, so then I think to myself, well, um, we don't want to start that kind of rhetoric of getting rid of things because we don't like it. You know, because we think it, you know, it'll somehow change things. I think. As Buddhists, what we should try to do is work with our own minds and examine what that art does to us. Yeah, to examine what it does and what we, what, you know, how it makes us feel. One of the things I did during the pandemic is I started a meditation group um, for artists. Yeah, um, you can. Uh, I will put it again in the chart. So laartcore.org. Yeah, it's called Meditate Create. Yeah, what we do with meditate create is we we meditate on art, you and we also examine what that does to us. You know, to be aware of the feelings that come up. You know, how do we manage those feelings? You know, how do we manage those thoughts? Yeah. So when we think about Buddhism, when again getting rid of art and beauty, we are getting rid of teachers to help us deal with our own minds. Yeah, that's right. There. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that can be like, that's also a question that I've thought of too. Um, but you explained it really well. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have the link to um, the, the website in the comment section. Sorry. Yeah. Um, we have another question. How was your experience with Food art exhibition, exhibition, which was co-organized by Food Art and Dhamma USA some years ago at the University of the West. I remember that exhibition. I remember that exhibition, and it was lovely. It was absolutely lovely, you know, to experience that, to experience people's take on it. And now, here's the question: We probably don't have time to get into it. There was a the question about. Um, I have a writer who will be doing something on this a little on in Lions Roar. This whole idea, well, what is Buddhist art? What is that? Yeah. Is it, it just because you have a painting of a Buddha, is that Buddhist art or is that just used as sort of decoration? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just because you have an image of the Buddha in the room doesn't make it Buddhist art. Right? <laughs> you know, is that Buddhist art? You know, you have you have a Buddha in the garden, is that Buddhist art? You know, it's like, well, I don't know. It, 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 I guess the whole discussion is like it comes Buddhist Buddhist thing called Buddhist art comes with um a whole uh, set of complexities, you know, the motivation behind it, 
you know, the purpose behind it, what's it trying to do, you know, what's it trying to, uh, uh, is, is, it, is it trying to um, be decoration, you know, uh, or is it me, or is it trying to do more than that? So like this, this passage, I thought it was really interesting, right? So this is an image of a Buddha or a monk, right? And it was interesting to me just because, so what I liked about, I considered more art because, so the whole idea was that when you look, the, the perception of the face changes, you know, in the room, you know, so there's this depth of perception that changes to me, you know. So I thought, oh, that's, that's really, really, really interesting. I've had, um, here is, if you take a look at this book I talked about in the thing, you know, this book by, by um, Don Farber. Now, this person dedicated his whole, you know, his career to capturing Buddhist images and exploring that and saying what, you know, what it could be in the world and, and the heritage of Buddhism in the world, right? So I think, well, that, that's Buddhist art because it's not just sort of like, oh, it's a pretty picture. Yeah. And when I saw Boudart, the Boudart exhibition, what I loved about that, that exhibition um, was the, the, the way Buddhism was depicted. It, it wasn't necessarily just an image of the Buddha, right? It was also abstract. So it could be, you know, it could be different ways to see um, Buddhism in an art form. So I hope it, uh, I hope it returns. I don't know if it re returned um, uh, since the pandemic, but I think, you know, any kind of, Exploration and discussion of what is Buddhism and, what, and Buddhist art is really, really important. Okay, so it looks like that was the last question. Awesome. So we do have the links for what. Um, for the website that Noel mentioned in uh, the comments section. Okay. Um. All right, so with that, we conclude our uh, session today. Thank you again, Noel, for um, the wonderful speech. It's really inspiring and, you know, really brought up a lot of childhood thoughts of mine. Um, and like, yeah. Um, but yeah, and thank you, of course, for letting me host today. Um, I hope I hope all the artists out there really come forward and keep creating, yeah, create something. Yeah. yeah. And it's not necessarily about having to be about rich and famous. Most artists are not that. Mm -hmm. you know, but they still create. Yeah. I think that's a, a wonderful gift and that um, we can do some good in the world with it. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that especially um, like artists who aren't exposed to Buddhism, like would really benefit from the teachings, like with the things like you mentioned, like, you know, depression and like anxiety or like, you know, being um, like kind of like comparing, I guess, like in like fashion, like comparing yourself to other people or like in yeah. general. So um, it's definitely really a great, um, a great move. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.